All right, hey everybody, and welcome back to the Nude Bible Study with me. Uh, today we're uh, continuing the series, How to Read the Bible, uh, by doing a field guide in every book of the Bible. Um, last time it was Isaiah, and now we're up to Jeremiah. Guys, we're making progress, getting through the entire Bible as we do this. Jeremiah, a book in a lot of ways, is about hope. Uh, so I dropped it in the comment section below about just where are you guys finding hope lately? Uh, where do you see hope uh, around the corner? Uh, somebody in our church here started a Facebook group called Bright Hope um, and uh, just laying encouraging things down uh, every single day. And the, the thing grew to hundreds and maybe even over a thousand uh, members now. And I just think it's super cool and it's such an encouragement to me personally. So you can check that out. Um, but today we're finding hope in Jeremiah. So let's jump right in. Uh, Jeremiah, it's a it's a bigger book of the Bible in the Old Testament. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, kind of all uh, this um, quite a bit of contact uh, in there. Um, first of all, when you hear Jeremiah, uh, what, uh, what stands out to you about it? What do you notice? What happened in Jeremiah? Do you know anything at all there is to know about the book? of Jeremiah. Obviously, there's probably somebody in here named Jeremiah, but let's check it out. I don't want you to miss the theme, so we're going to lay that down right off the bat. Hope beyond today is the theme of the book of Jeremiah. It's what I called it. <clears throat> I don't know, maybe you can come up with a, with a different theme, but a lot goes on in Jeremiah, and, uh, and it is a very, very hopeful book, uh, but not exactly for right now. Uh, there's a popular Bible passage in Jeremiah that talks about, uh, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Jeremiah 29, 11, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It is a book about hope, but anybody old enough to read that um, prophecy uh, was probably not going to see themselves out of a really tough situation. So it's kind of a man, we're stuck here, uh, but there's still hope later. Let me explain um, by taking a look at the summary of Jeremiah. Uh, that Jeremiah was an Israelite priest who lived and worked in Judah, and he was a prophet warning about breaking this covenant with God. Covenant, you might think of uh, contract, um, but that's like that's not relational enough. When covenants used in the Bible, think about um, think about it in less in terms of a business agreement and more in terms of a relational agreement. You could even say something like a marriage. And for Jeremiah, that's not going to be a stretch at all. Um, big key players: we got Israel, obviously, the Southern Kingdom, and Judah. We got Jeremiah, and then we've also got a big key player in Babylon. And so Jeremiah's prophecy is that Babylon, this big bad evil nation from the north, is going to come for Jerusalem. And he was a hundred percent correct. Now, one of the things that makes him unique is that Jeremiah actually witnessed these things happening, these things taking place. Um, and then he's going to tell us about that too. Big question in Jeremiah is how could God allow his people to remain in the land that symbolized their relationship with him when it was clear that they didn't even want that relationship? I mean, eventually, eventually in a relationship, you need to have two parties who are both listening to each other and understanding each other and responding to each other. Those of you in any kind of relationship, it doesn't matter if it's work, roommate situation, a romantic, you know, dating or marriage, you need to have two parties that listen and are attentive to one another. And God and his relationship with his people is no different. And God realizes, you know, I, I'm attentive to you and I'm hearing you out and I'm listening and responding to you. But you guys kind of stopped listening and responded to me. And so that's where Jeremiah comes in. Now, chapter 36 is an interesting one because it tells us a little bit about uh, Jeremiah and maybe why the book is the way that it is and kind of how why it reads a little bit differently. In, in Jeremiah 36, we see this command uh, for Jeremiah to collect all of his sermons and his poems and his essays and, and write them all down in one place. And that's a huge job. Uh, I think about like if I had to write down all the messages and all of the content like this that I gave, I would do what Jeremiah does, which is hire somebody else to do it. <laughs> he goes and finds a scribe named Baruch, and he hires Baruch to write this all out. And, and Baruch wrote not just what 
um, Jeremiah said in his essays and his sermons and things like that. Baruch also wrote about Jeremiah, which kind of makes it read a little bit more like an anthology, like we said. Jeremiah chapter 1, we see he's got this three-tiered um, kind of command or this mission. The first thing he's going to do, he's a prophet to, to Israel and all the nations. That's going to be important. Second mission that he has is to uproot and tear down. That's a message of destruction. That's a message of this is going to get hard. Uh, and then the third one is that he's going to plant and build up. So in other words, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It's going to go to some pretty dark places. But don't forget, church, it is a message. Uh, it is a, it's a book of, of hope, um, especially for now. Uh, Jeremiah, the first part kind of as a summary of the book, um, we just see that Israel is breaking the covenant. So they do this with the Canaanite gods. Um, Jeremiah uh, introduces idolatry worship, and the way he talks about that is uh, adultery, uh, right? So then there's this relational thing that's severed, right? That they're cheating on cheating on their God. And so he accuses um, the leaders, kings, prophets, priests, they're all of corruption. He talks about kind of the social justice angle, these widows, orphans, immigrants, people who can't care for themselves, can't look after themselves because they have so few uh, rights and privileges. Uh, these, are, these groups are all being taken advantage of and Jeremiah is lamenting all of this. And then we had like, oh, it all comes to a head in Jeremiah chapter 7, where he gives this temple sermon, this critical moment in the book. Out inside the temple, typical, you know, he's doing his, his worship thing. You know, I don't know exactly what it looked like. He's giving his sermon, you know, and it's regular church and everything's going on. But listen, outside the temple, like right outside the doors at the same time, there's Baal worship, there's the other gods worship, there's even this horrifying practice of child sacrifice. I mean, it hits rock bottom. They're embodying even the worst of all of the other worship practices of the nations. I mean, it's it's just terrible. And so Jeremiah, I mean, he just kind of understandably, he hits his limit. And he's saying, you cannot put God's name on all of this. And so God will destroy his own temple. Essentially saying God wants nothing to do with this at all. It's so far from him. God's going to destroy his own temple and he's going to use Babylon in order to do that. Uh, and Babylon was just a really, really awful nation. So that's very surprising. Chapter 25, Babylon is coming. There's going to be the 70-year exile. Again, that's exactly what happened. And what's interesting in Jeremiah 25, you see, and I think this is the first time it, it comes up this way, um, you see that there's a, like a cup, like a wine cup, uh, that's representative of God's um, anger and God's wrath. And Jeremiah is the one who's saying, listen, it's, it's, it's going to get poured out. That cup of God's righteous anger is going to get poured out. And just like remember that, right? Especially as I'm uh, coming to you right now, you know, it's a, uh, a week and a half out from Good Friday, Monday, Thursday, right? When we think about take this cup from me, right? Jeremiah introduced for us that concept, Anyway, and Babylon is the one who's going to be the agent of, of, of pouring it out there. Okay, uh, next big section uh, is that we see judgment and hope for Israel. Um, Jeremiah uh, begged Israel like, right up until the last moment, please, please, please turn around, turn around. And they never, they never did. Um, and so Jeremiah chapters uh, 30 through 33 um, there's some hope here as God's going to renew the covenant. He's quoting Moses, transform Israel's hearts. That's a big one. That is a huge deal. Uh, I wrote this one out here. Jeremiah 31 is a big chapter. It kind of messes everything up as far as like um, you know, practical living and, and theology and, and everything. Listen to what it says. Um, Jeremiah says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. What? A new covenant? We already have a covenant. You remember what the covenant is? The covenant is the Old Testament uh, Sinai, uh, Ten Commandments. Hey, you do this, follow these rules, and everything's going to go great for you. That's all you have to do. And God says, no, no, no we're going to give a new covenant. Not a replacement covenant, but we'll get to that in just a minute. But I'm coming with a new covenant um, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand or bring them out of Egypt, Sinai, Ten Commandments, you know, Moses and the stone tablets. Uh, my covenant that they broke, right? Again and again, they broke the covenant. 
uh, the, the Ten Commandments, the rules. Though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So it's not just a contract. It's a relational thing, as we keep saying. For this is the covenant I will make with Israel after all those days, declares the Lord. Whoa, I will put my law within them and I'll write it on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. So I'm going to take that covenant right, or I'm going to take that law and I'm going to write it, not on stone tablets. I'm going to write it right on their hearts where it cannot be undone. This is a huge deal. Really because we know things are going to get bad. And Jeremiah is saying, listen, the sin, the, the breaking of the covenant, um, it's not going to be the final word, the last thing. And then it ends with the siege on Jerusalem. And then, oddly enough, Jeremiah was not a popular character, surprising uh, a prophet. Um, his own people kidnap him and take him away off to Egypt. That's kind of the end of Jeremiah there. Um, and then we see the judgment and hope not on Israel, but on the nations now, everybody else around. Uh, we see this prophecy that God will use Babylon to judge the nations. And he, he lists off a bunch of them there. And then judgment is going to come on Babylon itself. Babylon is not going to be exempt or escape from all this. Yes, God is a just God. And in his timing, he'll see through and follow through on uh, what needs to be done. Uh, I just like as a note, Babylon is... It registers highly here and then also in the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. I don't know what we're going to do when we get to that one because that's just such a such a strange book. Um, but we'll get there. Uh, we'll do a video on that one eventually. Um, but Babylon is a, is a great kind of stand-in because they're like the archetypal rebellious nation. They're prideful. They're extravagant. They're wealthy. They have no need for God whatsoever, right? And so Babylon just works as a great stand-in for any kind of uh, act of rebellion or act of sin. When you need somebody to stand in as like the bad guy, um, Babylon is just the go-to. I mean, we do that with like Nazis or Hitler or something like that. When you just need a stand-in of a bad guy or a bad nation, like that's what you go to again and again. And and that's what they did uh, all the time. And so it ends with Babylon's attack on Jerusalem. Yes, everything happened exactly like Jeremiah was going to say. Um, and then it ends, uh, you know, while they're in Babylon for 70 years, um, it ends with a king who is in prison in Babylon, getting raised up and getting to seat at the king's table, uh, Jehoiachin. And he says, essentially, uh, you will not always live as prisoners. There's just like this glimmer of hope. You will not always live in exile. Hope is coming, but it's a long ways off. I mean, so guys, Jeremiah is in a huge way all about hope when you can't see hope. In fact, we've got a series coming up a little while later um, that the name of it is How to Hope, and it's based out of Jeremiah because that's what this book is about. Hope when you can't see any hope. Take a look at it. It's pretty great. Uh, we want to do uh, spotting Jesus in the book of Isaiah. Remember Isaiah and God, Israel, it's all about relationship. That's key. I said earlier that the key in any relationship is listening, is being attentive and stopping and paying attention. And God, God says, listen, I was always here and I was always listening. I always paid attention. But you all, we all stopped. And I just... Somebody asked me that one question is that when you, when you don't feel close to God anymore, who do you think moved? And that was very convicting for me uh, to recognize that, that God doesn't move away from us. God only draws toward us. When we feel distant from God, who moved? Ooh, very convicting. Um, I want to talk about this new covenant thing uh, that I mentioned in uh, in Jeremiah is that it's not a, uh, a replacement covenant, uh, but a fulfillment of the covenant. New means not a replacement, but an in addition to. Uh, that is, uh, I will do for you, God says, I will do for you what you couldn't do on your own. So we kept breaking the law. We, the Ten Commandments, we kept breaking all of the laws. We kept moving away from God. And God says, no, no, no. When you can't follow through on it, I will follow through on what you couldn't do on your own. To get there, we needed two things. First of all, we needed somebody who would pay the price of our feelings, past, present, and future. And second of all, we'd need someone on our side, a human representative, to be in relationship with God constantly. Both of those are fulfilled perfectly in Jesus. And just because Good Friday is coming up, I don't want us to miss that cup language from Jeremiah 25. You guys remember that? 
Oh, man. In the same way, uh, the cup language from Jeremiah 25 was all about um, God pouring out his wrath, the sin that we have. It needs to be atoned for. It needs to be paid for. Um, and Jesus recognizes that. As on the night that he was betrayed on Thursday, so a week from tomorrow, we're going to be recognizing that. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup and saying, this cup is the new covenant, new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This new covenant, this new system of God saying, I will do for you what you can't do on your own. And Jesus is saying, this is how that's going to happen. I will be your human representative that will never fall out of relationship with my father. I will do that for you. And I will also drink from that cup of God's wrath. I will drink it down to the very, very end. I will undergo that punishment and I will never leave our Father in heaven on your behalf. Everything in Jeremiah points towards Jesus to be the one who did for us what we could not do for ourselves. It's a beautiful book, How to Hope, the book of Jeremiah. Check it out. I can't wait to do a whole series on this one a little bit later on uh, early this summer. Uh, for now, I'm going to leave some reflection questions uh, up on the screen. If you've got a comment or an insight like Shirley does, drop it in the comment section below. Thank you always for paying attention, and we'll see you next week at noon for continuing this series, How uh, to Read the Bible, uh, a field guide for spotting Jesus in every book. Take care, everybody.